Good evening, I'm Tommy Wolf, and I'd like to welcome you to tonight's presentation. I've got a couple of announcements before we continue, and one I think many of you have already done is either mute or please turn off your cell phones. And um, also, you have the comment forms, if you would complete those at the end of the session and turn, just put them on the table when you go to leave. Our presenter tonight is Richard, or Dick Wolf, and he has had a very special interest in the naval aspect of the Civil War for many years. Dick has done a number of presentations for all, and tonight he will be discussing Fort Fisher and how it was the last stronghold during the Civil War. We will learn how the Union Navy and Army assembled a high joint amphibious force to capture the South's last coastal fort in Wilmington, North Carolina in the last months of the Civil War. Please join me in welcoming Dick. Thank you, Mrs. Wolf, Tommy, who happens to be my sister-in-law. Isn't that right? Is that the right? Yeah, OK. Um, this is my sixth, I think, presentation regarding the Union and Confederate navies in the Civil War. I originally got the interest in this subject when I was a member of a Civil War roundtable in Rockford, Illinois. And the presentations that were given at this in this in at that uh, round table never seemed to include any reference to the Navy and its role in the Civil War. And uh, I wanted to fill that role, so I became the naval historian for that Civil War roundtable, and I brought the uh, presentations that I made in Rockford up here, and I've done six of them so far. Tonight, our subject is the last stronghold. Where we are now tonight in this presentation is the last months of the Civil War, December of, 19, of 1864 and January of 1865, within three months of the end of the war. The Union Navy at this point was extremely strong. The Confederate Navy had disappeared and was destroyed. And the Navy had one last battle, one long last battle as an important um, end closing to their terrific performance during the, during the years of the Civil War. And that last performance was our subject tonight, the campaign for Fort Fisher. First, let's take a look at the location, layout, and defenses of Fort Fisher. By 1864, the Union's Anaconda Plan became an effective economic stranglehold and barrier to the Southern cause as the Union Navy closed port after port to Southern exports of cotton and lumber and closed those ports also to the imports of war materials that the South needed. Blockade runners by 1864 no longer had the ability to disregard the Union Navy as they had in the earlier years, because now the Union Navy had increased from fewer than a dozen effective naval operation ships to more than 600. And as a result, the blockade became more and more effective as they were able to blockade and prevent the imports and exports out of the Southern ports. Wilmington, North Carolina, and I'm gonna step out of the field here for a minute to show you, is right here. It's right at the intersection of the South Atlantic Squadron under one admiral and the North Atlantic Squadron under another admiral. Wilmington was just upriver from the mouth of the Cape Fear River and was the site of the blockade runners who would come from Bermuda or from the Nassau Islands 
to bring imports into all of these ports until they were closed, Wilmington being the last port still open at the end of 1864. The blockade runners would leave Wilmington to St. George in the Bermuda Islands or down to the Nassau Islands. And because the, these blockade runners were small vessels and not really ocean going vessels, they would offload at St. George and regular Atlantic ability ships would carry the goods the rest of the way to England, bring back the materials that the blockade runners would then reload for the return trip back to Wilmington. Now it was cotton mainly that was being exported and there were tremendous profits for these blockade runners where cotton could be bought at eight cents a pound could be sold for five dollars a pound in England. On the other hand, for imports, cotton, uh, coffee that was bought in Bermuda for 50 cents for a five pound bag would sell for $50. So the profits were enormous to these blockade runners and they were willing to take the risks of being captured by the Union ships that were trying to stop the traffic. Typically the small blockade runners would slip out and travel no farther than either Bermuda or Nassau because of their inability to sail on the open Atlantic any farther than that. They could not risk the danger of open going, open, uh, open ocean ships. Because of several aspects of the approach to Wilmington, including Fort Fisher, which was at, I'm gonna step away again, Wilmington was up about 28 miles from the mouth of the Cape Fear River and Fort Fisher was right down there at the bottom, at the mouth of the river. The runners came and went on schedule, openly defying the uh, Union Navy. But by the end of 64, Wilmington stood alone as the only remaining Southern port still open to exports and imports. Even though the Union Navy had 33 ships stationed off Wilmington, the blockade runners still were able to evade capture. If the war was to end soon, Wilmington had to be captured. Why? Because Wilmington could provide the supplies necessary for Grant, who was trying to make a last ditch effort to defend Richmond. The Wilmington supplies were necessary for Lee to continue his battle of resisting Grant's implacable and irresistible force as he advanced towards Richmond. There were two railroads that connected Wilmington and Richmond to bring the supplies in and, and carry other things out of the city. But when Grant got close enough to Richmond to block one of the railroads, it became necessary for a roundabout route for through the other railroad to continue the open shipment of materials in and out of Richmond and into Wilmington. Here's a close up, gives an idea of how difficult Wilmington was for the Union forces. The city was 28 miles upriver from the entrance to the river. And the shallowness of the entrances to the river made the close approach to uh, uh, of only smaller vessels possible. And because the Union had to guard two entrances, The new inlet was one entrance to the river and the old inlet was the other entrance to the, to the uh, river. The difficulties, in addition to the difficulties posed by the geography, the uh, gun emplacements that uh, ringed the uh, river up and down from Wilmington made it impossible for any of the Union ships to advance 
up the Cape Fear River, they had to stay in the Atlantic. And because the Atlantic weather was often very bad, they were often driven off station and that made the blockade runners uh, uh, work easier to get into the river and up to Wilmington. Rear Admiral Lee was the head of the North Atlantic Squadron responsible for blockading Wilmington. And he had been trying to get Secretary of the War, Gideon Wells, to put Wilmington as a more important objective in the war because Admiral Lee realized that the supplies that were going on to General Lee up in Richmond were necessary and had to be stopped. But the Navy was distracted by the political necessity of closing some of the other ports. And this delay allowed the buildup of Fort Fisher that ultimately made the attack when it came so much more difficult. This picture shows the harbor of Wilmington about 28 miles up the Cape Fear River from the open Atlantic. The remoteness from the Union ships prevented the city from enduring any bombardment from the Atlantic, which was the natural way of keeping the other ports along the coast closed. The city had about 5,000 residents and probably an equal number of slaves. It made it the largest city in North Carolina with a gentle and very beautiful past but the war had brought a seedy air to the place as it was flooded with desperate, ruthless men, which gave the place a Wild West aspect. The profit rewards possible for the privately owned and operated runners was substantial. I've already mentioned how coffee could be 10 times more expensive in Wilmington than what it was bought for in Nassau. Cotton sold for exported at eight cents and sold for 10 times that in Europe. The amount of war supplies was also vital to the South. For example, during one month of 1864, more than 8 million pounds of meat, a million pounds of lead for bullets, um, 2 million pounds of saltpeter for making gunpowder, 500,000 pairs of shoes, 300,000 blankets, 69,000 rifles, all were able to reach the Southern troops. However, by 1864, the odds of a successful blockade runner had dropped from one in 10 to one in three, as the blockades of this single port had increased by this time to more than 30 vessels. And in addition to the geographical difficulties facing the Union forces, this map shows the various defenses along the river banks that the, uh, the gun emplacements were uh, able to successfully defend any intruders up the Cape Fear River. Fort Fisher is located at the end of the long promontory that, that is on the Atlantic, the eastern side of the Cape Fear River. Here's a close-up of Federal Point, the end of the uh, promontory uh, down to the mouth of the Cape Fear River, where it shows Fort Fisher as I go off the camera for a minute. Here, this is called the land face because it was designed to protect against forces advancing on the land towards it. This is the sea face, which was designed to protect against any forces coming from the Atlantic. You notice that this fort is not enclosed. There was nothing behind. There was no protection for the fort from behind because they felt that the shallowness of the, of the Cape Fear River made it impossible for any of the heavy Union warships to get into the river and try to shell the fort from behind. So they are, their guns only pointed north from the land face and out to sea from the sea face. 
Here's an even more detailed close-up that shows the individual cannons and uh, mortar installations. The heaviest installations were on the land face with the main gate on the left-hand side, the shepherd's battery. That's what was the eventual entrance point for the Union when they made their attack. Then the land face advanced about uh, 300 yards towards the northeast bastion, the highest and most important of the uh, fort's defenses, which had a hospital and the headquarters and a lot of the ammunition storage and um, uh, places where the soldiers could hide when the, when the um, shells came, came in. Then each one of these along the sea face was an individual set of cannons all the way down to the mound battery at the bottom, almost uh, a half a mile long. The land face consisted of 16 hollow mounds of sand called traverses, which were separated by gun platforms, which were called parapets for 20 cannon facing the land attack. The traverses were more than 30 feet high and 30 feet thick, all made of sand that had been carried from other points behind the fort to build up this defense from what was otherwise a flat beach. In front of the land face was also a palisade of uh, nine foot tall sharpened pine stumps to form a fence in front of the uh, land face. And in front of that, there were even some mines that were uh, dug into and concealed in the sand in front of the Palisades. Mound Battery down at the bottom was the tallest of the uh, traverses. It was more than 60 feet high and had a beacon at the top that helped guide the blockade runners at night. This shows some of the detailed placement of the cannons and their sizes. They're all different kinds. They had about 48 different cannons spread out over the land face and the sea face and of different sizes and different calibers. And unlike other masonry forts at the time, uh, the enormous amounts of sand were the main protection for this fort as the sand had demonstrated an ability to absorb shell impacts. And in front of the land face, a half mile of uh, scrub had been cleared down to the sand to make it harder to conceal yourself as you were approaching the approaching in, as in an attack. The most important and significant weakness, however, of the fort wasn't the fort itself, but, but was the fact that it only had 1,500 defenders. They were very short-handed. Here's looking at the land face from the outside. This picture gives uh, some idea of the defenses facing an attacker. The land was cleared in front of the fort for better firing and also aided by the 30 foot elevations of the traverses to fire down on advancing troops. Mines were placed under the sand in front of the land face to be detonated by wires which led into the fort. Here's the picture from behind one of the traverses which shows the steepness of the diverse facing an attacker and an entrance to the bomb proofs on the interior side for the protection of the defenders and a cannon on a parapet in between two, two traverses. This is also taken from the interior of the fort, shows how the traverses were connected with the guns placed between them. This arrangement minimized exposure 
of the guns to enemy fire. Battery Buchanan was a mile south of the fort, the last in the line of the uh, sea face, and directly overlooked the new inlet, which was the main entrance for the blockade runners. Its main responsibility was to protect that entrance from the approach of Union ships chasing the blockade runners. Here's a picture of the intersection of the land face and the sea face, which was called the pulpit. It was also the headquarters, the hospital, and the main ammunition de depot for the fort. Here's a picture of the palisade that proved to be such an enormous difficulty for the attackers. These were sharpened uh, trunks of pine trees that were stretched in front of the land face for more than a half a mile. And here's a, another picture of the Northeast Bastion, the pulpit at the intersection of the land and sea face with this a stockade in front of it that you can see, the palisade in front of it that made it so difficult for an attacker to get over the palisade and then up a 30 foot uh, traverse to get to the defenders. This is a picture of Battery Shepherd, which is if you see in the far left-hand side, there's a gate. That was the entrance that the Union was able to breach to make their entrance into the fort when they made their attack, finally. And here's another picture of a bomb proof from the interior. This is how the, the sand protected the supplies and the uh, men when they were under attack. And during the battle, the fort's gunners only appeared from the bomb proofs to fire their guns and then retreated back to safety. This inability to maintain a constant fire was occasioned by the lack of supplies, the lack of ammunition, which had to be carefully conserved. The fort had a variety of cannon, more than 48 in number, and ranging from small field howitzers to a huge cannon throwing a 170 pound ball. The cannon shown here is a typical smoothbore, largely obsolete, but effective at short range. It could not reach the offshore fleet, but some of the rifled guns, early breech loaders, could hurl a 12 pound bolt five miles. Here's one of the behemoths, the formidable cannon which could throw a 150 pound shell over two miles, but whose usefulness in the battle was limited because the fort only had 13 shells for it. All the cannons suffered from this lack of ammunition and the defenders had to be limited to one shell an hour. Now let's take a look at the planners and the military leaders leading up to the fight. After the fall of Mobile, Secretary of the Navy, Gideon Wells, finally thought it was time to raise with President Lincoln the pleas of Rear Admiral Lee for the attack on Wilmington. Secretary of the War Stanton agreed as well, and their arguments were accepted by Lincoln in August of 1864. If General Grant would commit the necessary troops to accompany the naval forces. Wells then sent Assistant Secretary to the Navy, Gustavus Fox, to discuss the idea with General Grant, who would have to provide the troops. Grant was at first reluctant to, to divert the troops he was using uh, in the assault on Richmond, but finally agreed to supply troops for an October sailing. For leadership, 
Wells wanted Admiral Farragut, the hero of Mobile, to lead this expedition, but Farragut was in ill health at the time. And so uh, Rear Admiral David Porter, who happened to be the stepbrother of Admiral Farragut, uh, was appointed to lead the expedition. This was a move that deeply disappointed Rear Admiral Lee, who had to step down from his command of the North Atlantic Squadron and yield his post to Admiral Porter. During September, Fox returned to Grant's headquarters to introduce uh, him to Porter and to begin plans. Here we have Assistant Secretary Gustavus Fox was the perfect aide to Secretary Wells. He was loyal, competent, hardworking, and without ambition for his boss's job. He recommended the selection of Admiral Porter and implemented the plans proposed by Wells in a cooperation of Army and Navy that was workmanlike, even if it was slow to materialize. Admiral Porter worked to familiarize himself with the responsibilities during October and November. He asked Grant for a date when he could expect the arrival of the troops necessary, but Grant kept putting him off. Relations further cooled when Grant allowed General Butler to take command of the troops from General Weitzel. General Weitzel had been Grant's choice initially to lead the army forces. Here's Admiral David Dixon Porter, tough, smart, wartime commander, having served in the New Orleans and Vicksburg campaigns. 51, he had served continuously at sea since he was 10 years old. When he did a good job of assembling the naval forces for the attack, and was clearly authoritative and decisive. He had several incautious, cocksure decisions on his part that nearly caused the attack to fail and cost many lives unnecessarily. This was characteristic of his pride, as well as his attempt to outshine his foster brother, Admiral Farragut, whose career and victory at Mobile he envied and thought wanted to surpass. Here's General Godfrey Weitzel, who was Grant's choice to lead the army troops on the first expedition, even though Butler superseded him, pulled rank and superseded him. Admiral Porter knew Weitzel and approved. He was a 29-year-old Corps commander and chief engineer of the Army of the James. Weitzel had even traveled to visit the fleet offshore at Cape Fear for two days and to take a measure of the fort. It was his conclusion that the 15,000 troops that Porter thought would be necessary for the salt was excessive and they could be done with only 6,000, which was a serious underestimate. It was in any event all that Grant was willing to spare. After General Butler, Weitzel's superior exercised his privilege of rank and took the role of overall commander, Weitzel became second in command and remained loyal to his mentor. And as a footnote, General Weitzel resurfaces after the war in the Army Corps of Engineers and did extensive work on the expansion of the Sioux Locks in Upper Michigan during the 1870s. General Ben Butler insisted on assuming command, superseding Weitzel in command, with the excuse that the appointed leader was inexperienced and the magnitude of the expedition, he explained to Grant, required a mature commander. Actually, Butler wanted to regain his reputation, which was in shreds after his failure of leadership at New Orleans and a bungled attack at Petersburg. Grant did not have confidence in Butler's ability, but apparently did not wish to contravene the, in, the influence that Butler had 
and exercised in taking command. Butler was easily the most controversial officer of the Union, having parlayed a strong political base into a major generalship. And uh, Admiral Porter was furious that Butler had superseded Weitzel, for Porter well knew of the deficiencies of Butler from their service together in New Orleans. As for the Southern leaders, General Braxton Bragg had begun his career with great promise, having fought the Seminoles and uh, the Mexican War after graduation from West Point. But it was his loss at Chattanooga the year before that caused his removal from command, although President Davis made him his military advisor. President Davis apparently liked the man, although others thought him to be cold, aloof, indecisive, and, and incapable of admitting error. The rumors of the imminent attack on Wilmington caused President Davis to turn to Bragg, overruling General Lee, who wanted someone else to send to command the military forces around Wilmington. This demoted the longtime district commander, General Whiting, whom General Lee thought to be inadequate. This assignment prompted the Richmond newspaper to lament in bold type, goodbye Wilmington, a reference to the idea that they were convinced that sending Braxton Bragg to defend Wilmington was a major mistake. In any event, Bragg arrived in Wilmington on December 17th, 1864, one week before the first attack, bringing a division of combat venerals, veterans to reinforce Wilmington. Here's Colonel William Lamb, North Carolina artillery assigned, had been the commander of the fort since July of 62 and he undertook supervising the fort's expansion and strengthening between 62 and 64. Under his direct supervision, the meager 17 cannon in place when he arrived were gradually increased and the fortifications strongly connected. As many as a thousand soldiers and slaves worked continuously for two years to heap up the sand necessary for the traverses and the parapets. And while his pleas for more cannon were met, he never was able to get enough troops to adequately ban the garrison. And it was this inability to obtain reinforcement that seriously weakened the fort. Major Whiting had arrived in Wilmington to take charge of Wilmington and and the Cape Fear District in November of 62, and he was replaced or at least demoted by General Bragg when Bragg arrived in November, in December of 64. He was, Whiting was perhaps the most skilled engineer in the South and immediately realized the deficiency of Fort Fisher. And working with Colonel Lamb was the main architect for strengthening the fort. In these efforts, he relied on the commander, for, uh, Colonel La Lamb, whose zeal in these efforts matched his own. Now let's take a look at the first attack. We call this the first expedition because it didn't go very far and there had to be a second. Because an assembly of the fleet and the troop transports in Newport was the worst keep kept secret during the fall of 64, the South was well aware of the impending attack on Wilmington and countered by detaching Bragg and 6,500 badly needed reinforcements from their trench positions in Petersburg. I'm gonna go, oops, here we are. I'm gonna go off camera here for a minute. Braxton Bragg was sent by railroad with General Hoke's men in this roundabout route down, I'm sorry, down to, down to uh, Wilmington, down here. 
the direct route from Wilmington was this railroad here, but it was cut on its way to Richmond by Grant's occupation of Petersburg and the attack at Richmond. So it, re it required this roundabout route to get down. Newport News was where the army embarked on army transports and joined the Navy on their sail down to first Beaufort and then to Fort Fisher. After delays during October and November, which worried Porter as winter storms approached, the Union fleet and army transports finally left Hampton Roads on December 13th and arrived off Wilmington on December 18th. A fierce winter storm forced the troop transports back to Beaufort, 90 miles north, until the rough water subsided. Admiral Porter did not await the return of their troops for the operation of his naval forces to begin on December 23rd. That night, December 23rd, he had a bomb ship clo uh, towed close to the shore and fuses lit. The bomb ship idea had come originally from Butler, although it had been skeptically reviewed by Navy export experts. Porter evidently wanted to explode the bomb ship and claim the credit for himself and the Navy, even though there would be no troops to pick up the pieces afterwards. Here's a picture of the bomb ship where they loaded it with gunpowder, 215 tons of gunpowder. Porter and Butler thought that by towing this ship onto the shore close to the, to the sea face, that it would demolish the walls of the fort in a tremendous explosion. Porter bought into this scheme and furnished the ship. Experts, however, after the fact, concluded correctly that 215 tons of powder was inadequate. The location of the bomb ship explosion is shown here. First, it was too far too far off the land face to do any damage. Should have been down here someplace. Also, because the ship was so heavily loaded, it was so low in the water that much of the explosion just pushed the water aside instead of sending a shock wave towards the, towards the fort. It was a thousand yards from the fort and all the blast was spectacular. It was too far away to cause any damage on two o'clock in the morning on December 24th. Additionally, the explosion of the powder did not occur all at once, but apparently the fuses burned at different times and over a short period of time, there were several explosions further reducing the effect. In any event, that particular idea was a failure, and so the bombardment would have to begin. Porter deployed his ships to begin the bombardment on noon of December 24th. This shows the deployment of the 60 ships, including four ironclad monitors with 635 guns total of the fleet assembled by Porter and their combined fire, firepower focused on the fort. The fleet expended over 20,000 shells in a futile attempt to knock down the traverses and disable the guns on their parapets. Accuracy was poor, and many shells fell into the sand and river behind the fort. Only two cannon were destroyed by hits and 23 men wounded. On the Union side, there were even more casualties but they were self-inflicted as several cannons exploded and injured or killed their handlers. The barrage ended after five hours, Admiral Porter incorrectly believing that the weak response of the fort indicated that the damage was extensive. Actually, the, in, the inadequate weak response of the fort was due to the fact of their limited ammunition. The fort filed, fired only 600 shells because Colonel Lamb only had 3,600 in total. 
for all of his cannon. Wisely, he kept most of his men protected inside the bomb proofs. He telegraphed Wilmington and Bragg that the attack had begun and received word that Bragg was going to send some, some men to, for, to um, Sugarloaf, which was halfway between Wilmington and Fort Fisher, as in support of the fort. Such assistance never came, however, as Bragg's initial bravado uh, didn't pan out. The logistics of the, of the bombardment was a huge task, ably executed by Porter, who ran up and down his lines of ships in his flagship, the USS Malvern. To the defenders, the rain of shells was continuous. Included in the Union forces was a ship called the USS New Ironsides in contrast to, of course, old Ironsides, which was the famous wooden ship of uh, the War of 1812. The new Ironsides was the latest in naval firepower and clearly shows that the Navy had turned its back on obsolete wooden sailing ships in favor of steam propulsion exclusively and an iron or steel hull. The modernity of this battleship is evident. Here's another picture of old irons, uh, new iron size. Ugly, but effective, very deadly, heavy cannon, able to maneuver with a steam power, no more relying on sails, and an a iron and steel hull that was very much more invulnerable. On the other hand, Porter's flagship was the USS Malvern, was a former blockade runner. <clears throat> it was speedy and maneuverable, and Porter used it effectively to travel swiftly between the many ships in the fleet to maintain order. The four monitors were large and powerful, but suffered from the lack of ocean-going capabilities. Still, they had huge 15-inch guns in their turrets, the round structure on top of the very low freeboard of the monitor. And their accuracy was deadly. This was a dead-end technology, however, <coughs> as the new Ironsides could mount many more heavy such guns and still had ocean-going capabilities. The three types of naval technology are shown here in this, in this picture. This was the time of transition. Wooden sailing ships were on the way out and were briefly followed by the monitors, the, both the single turret monitors and the double turret monitors. And the new iron side, all metal and all steam was the future. During the morning of December 25th, Christmas morning, as the bombardment commenced and troops were preparing to land north of the fort, one of the truly daring escapades of the battle took place at the south end of Fort Fisher at the New Inlet. Admiral Porter wanted to make sure that his warships were too big and had too heavy draft to get into the river and bombard the fort from behind. So he sent this young and daring Lieutenant Cushing, who had already successfully led several raiding pa parties along the coast. Lieutenant Cushing in several small boats took soundings right in front of the Buchanan battery at the mouth of the river. And firing on the boats was so intense it felt like a hailstorm. One, re one sailor recounted later. Cushing was happy to get out with only a few injured and reported that the channel to be dangerously narrow and directly in the line of fire of a battery Buchanan and Porter's idea of an attack from the riverside of the fort would not work. 
Beginning at 10 a.m. on Christmas Day, several ships began to shell the landing zone selected by the troops north of the fort to force back any of the troops that were organizing at Sugarloaf. Let me go off picture for a minute. Troops in Wellington had formed a defensive line at Sugarloaf right here. The federal army troops were, were ferried ashore here about a mile north of the uh, fort. And the first question was, what was gonna happen when these troops came ashore? Were they going to be attacked because they were relatively defenseless on the beach? The answer to that was Bragg was unwilling to commit his troops. And so the troops came ashore. A boat crew uh, was the uh, won the uh, race to the nearest shore battery, which was Battery Anderson down here because the army troops were supplemented by a smaller number of sailors and Marines from the fleet who wanted to get into the fight themselves. So they came ashore with the sailors, with the army men and captured the, uh, made the first capture of Battery Anderson. General Weitzel also went ashore with the troops and pushed across the peninsula to cut the uh, telegraph line and establish a defense to any attack from the troops from the north and Sugarloaf. He then advanced to within a mile of the fort and sent ahead observers to survey the situation close to the land face. What they saw impressed them. The fort's high mounds and towering palisade were formidable obstacles. By now, Christmas night, as it was growing dark, and only 2,300 troops had landed with 4,000 still held in reserve in the ships. Weitzel, who had, had been trained defensively in his engineering skills, became convinced that the attack would not succeed and relayed this to Butler offshore. This is where General Butler got cold feet and ordered a withdrawal feeling that the fort was too strong and the troops were vulnerable to an attack from the rear by a superior force. The fort was strong, but there should have been no fear of an attack from Bragg from behind, who remained in Wilmington seemingly paralyzed by indecision and frightened by reports at Sugarloaf that the Union forces were too strong to attack. Additionally, as darkness fell and the fleet ceased its firing, the fort's defenders once again manned their cannons and began to pour fire into the troops facing them on the land face, further convincing Weitzel that damage to the fort was minimal. The evacuation was suspended that evening, leaving 700 troops stranded on the beach and to be retrieved the next morning. By that time, the officers who had been abandoned were very angry at having what they viewed as an easy victory denied them by timidity. But by then, Butler had already departed for Norfolk and disgrace. After the last troops were retrieved, the transports sailed back to Hampton Roads on December 27th and the warships retreated to Beaufort. This shows the final position of the Union troops before being recalled to the beach and evacuation. In the fort, relief at the departure of the fleet was tempered by the thought that they would return. Bragg, on the other hand, actually made plans to withdraw from Sugarloaf back to Wilmington as he believed no renewal of the attack would occur until spring. This alarmed Whiting and Lamb inside the fort, who rightly believed that the fleet would return sooner 
and that meeting the next attack on the beach was the only way to defeat the invasion. A second try, the next month. After the failure of the first expedition, Porter reviewed the evidence. He was extremely critical of Butler as expected, and he tried to avoid any blame for the Navy. Particularly alarming, however, was his realization that his gunnery had failed to inflict serious damage on the fort. This could be attributed to lack of practice on the part of his blockading gunners, who rarely had a chance to exercise their guns. This would not be repeated as he instituted regular practices. Grant also reviewed the efforts and siding with Porter, saw Butler was the problem. Butler was removed as commander of the Army of the James and his military career ended. This debacle did not diminish the intent of Secretary Wells to try again. And this time, General Grant, perhaps, perhaps embarrassed by his uh, acquiescence in allowing Butler to command in the previous expedition, appointed a more competent commander of the troops. Here, Brevet Major General Alfred Terry. General Terry also got more troops increasing the force to almost 9,000 men and adding engineers, field artillery, and mortars for the job. Appointed to the position on January 2nd, such was the desire for secrecy on Grant's part. Terry was on board and on his way and didn't even know where he was going. Most of the troops, as before, were from New York, including black troops. Terry was ordered by Grant to start a siege if the attack failed. Butler had received the same instructions, but ignored them. Terry began his command with grace, meeting and charming a suspicious porter who originally thought Terry to be another incompetent citizen soldier like Butler. But that was not the case. On January 8th, the troop transports linked up with the fleet, which had been waiting for them at Beaufort, and the second expedition was ready. A storm delayed their departure of the combined fleet from Beaufort, and they arrived off Cape Fear on the evening of January 12th. 59 ships, 21 troop transports, 9,000 army uh, soldiers in the transports. Porter and Terry decided to begin the, um, the bombardment the next morning with a simultaneous landing of troops. This time the fleet would anchor closer to shore and concentrate fire on gun emplacements instead of the traverses, learning a valuable lesson from their last attempt. This shows the huge bombardment, bombardment and the landing of troops January 13th and their placement before the assault commenced on January 15. Note the division of the Army Forces position in front of the land face and the Naval Forces, much smaller, brigade positioned to the east in front of the pulpit. In the fort, Lamb had telegraphed Bragg of the return of the fleet and Bragg had ordered troops to march, from, to march back to Sugarloaf and prevent a landing if possible. If the Union troops could not be prevented from landing, there were, they were to establish a defensive line across the peninsula north of the landing to protect Wilmington. Implicit in all of this was Bragg's belief that the fort would have to fend for itself. They were on their own. The second bombardment was identical to the first, but with much greater accuracy. Note the many splashes here signifying return from the fort, a great exaggeration as Colonel Lamb had very little ammunition left to reply. At seven o'clock a.m. on January 13th, the fleet opened up with more than 600 cannon, initially concentrating on the woods behind the landing area to keep defenders on Sugarloaf forced 
to remain north of the landing area and unable to attack the defenders as they landed on the beach. Another unopposed landing on the peninsula and another missed opportunity for General Bragg. As the troops landed, Southern defenders were practically within sight. The heavy shelling had deterred the, the troops at Sugarloaf from advancing to oppose the landings and the Union troops quickly formed a protective skirmish line along the woods above the beach. By three o'clock in the afternoon, almost 8,000 men were ashore, along with supplies for six days. General Whiting inside the fort was disgusted by the lack of resolve on the part of Bragg and left Bragg's headquarters to return by boat to the fort to be with his friend Lamb during the attack. When he arrived at the fort, he said to Lamb with a little optimism, I have come to share your fate. You and your garrison are to be sacrificed. Although the fort was reinforced from men called in from the other, other fortifications along the river, Colonel Lamb had only 1,500 defenders. After the landings had finished in the afternoon of the 13th, during the next day, the 14th, Terry positioned his troops defensively facing the north and within one mile of the land face on the south. So he was defending two fronts. He had to make sure that he wouldn't be attacked from the rear from Sugarloaf, and he had to also have his troops face the land face and the front of the fort. Going out to Porter's flagship, Terry conferred with Porter and said he was ready to attack the next day on January 15th. Porter said he would continue the bombardment until three o'clock on the afternoon of January 15th and then cease the shelling and sound all the fleet's whistles to signal Terry's advance. By this time, the bombardment had resulted in more than 200 casualties and the ruin of the land phase. Meanwhile, during the day of the 14th, Bragg had gone to Sugarloaf to survey the situation and taking a look at the strength of the defensive line facing him, decided an attack to relieve the fort would fail. The fort would have to do without his help. If Bragg had attacked when the assault on the fort began and Bragg had attacked from behind, Southern forces stood a good chance of breaking through the rear defenses of the Union line, as Terry feared. Terry was prepared to take that risk, but Bragg was not. This shows the placement of the Army and Navy as Terry studied his position just prior to the attack on the afternoon of January 15th. In addition to the Army units, a separate force of more than 1,800 sailors and 400 Marines from every ship in the fleet also landed to move against the Northeast Bastion simultaneously with the Army attack on the left end of the land face. Let me go off camera here for a minute. The army was massed here in front of the land face. They were going to attack around the left end. This was the main gate to the fort. That was their attack point. Porter, in his pride to gain some glory, asked for volunteers and 1,800 sailors, armed only with pistols and cutlasses, were put ashore and their job was to try to take the, the Northeast Bastion by hand-to-hand -hand fighting. An impossible job because they were 30 feet below and behind the Palisades and their pistols were only going to be effective if they were within 25, 30 feet of an enemy. The reason for this participation by the Navy in the ground attack seemed to be because of Porter's last minute desire to share in the fight and gain some of the glory. It was a mistake entirely attributable to his pride. Concerns by army commanders voiced to the officers of the sailors as they massed on the beach 
but the sailors ignored any advice. To support these efforts, Porter concentrated his shell fire on the land face in the Northeast Bastion, softening the defenses considerably and disabling almost every gun. But however, there were plenty of men still left behind the traverses to defend against anyone advancing up the steep slope. At three in the afternoon, January 15th, the assault began as the naval bombardment ceased and all of the steam whistles of the fleet announced the attack. This shows the attack by the Navy and Marines on the corner of the fort. The Marines were to have stayed in sand pits and offered suppressing fire over the heads of the advancing sailors to keep the defenders under cover but they apparently got caught up in the disorganized rush of the sailors and advanced also across the completely flat and open sandy beach. This was devastating for the sailors who were armed only with pistols and cutlasses and could not fire at the defenders until they met hand to hand after advancing 600 yards completely exposed. Colonel Lamb had positioned about 500 of his troops along the bastion at that corner, and the defenders had the advantage of their elevated position and poured terrible rifle fire into the advancing sailors, totally exposed, who never made it beyond the Palisades before being routed. The Palisade provided a little cover because most of the attackers could not hide behind it and the bunched up crowds were easy targets for the defenders. 300 casualties left on the beach in minutes as the sailors retreated. Observers in the fleet offshore were shocked. The participation of the sailors in this operation was a mistake that doomed hundreds of them to death by foolishly arming them as if it were a boarding party between two naval ships. This identifies the three brigades, brigades that successfully moved against the gate at the left end of the fort called the Shepherd's Battery and how the desperate defenders even turned their sea face cannons around to fire directly into the locked forces killing friend and foe alike. During all of this messages across the river to be relayed to brag for reinforce, reinforcements all went unanswered. During the whole battle, Bragg tried only once to advance on the rear of the Union forces and quickly withdrew to Sugarloaf when he encountered the colored troops solidly entrenched. Although the sailors and Marines had been routed under the direction of Lamb and Whiting in the Northeast Bastion, the defenders turned around to see that the first two brigades of General Terry's men had breached the gate on the left end of the fort and 4,000 Union soldiers were now on and behind the traverses, gradually forcing their way eastward from gun parapet to gun parapet, forcing the defenders back and southward. Porter received accurate signal reports about the advance of the army from signalmen on the beach and had his fleet resume the shelling from offshore, sending accurate fire into the remaining traverses, often only yards from, their, from, his, from his Union forces. When the third brigade of Terry's men was thrown in, fresh soldiers to support the, exhaust, the exhausted initial troops, and then a fourth brigade moved forward from their defensive positions Facing Sugarloaf, Colonel Lamb had nothing left to counter with, and the outcome was sealed. Both Lamb and Whiting had been wounded and lay in the hospital near the Northeast Bastion. As night fell on January 15th, the defenders were forced back and fought without leadership. Groups of defenders began to surrender. As well, Terry ordered some of his defensive troops including the 27th Colored Troops off the rear line facing Sugarloaf and into the Battle of the Fort. Black soldiers had been positioned to guard the rear of the Union lines as they advanced in case Bragg stirred from his position. 
These troops, however, did move to the front in the final phases of the attack to assure the Union victory. In the evening, the remaining defenders, perhaps 300 in number not captured or dead, and carrying both the wounded Lamb and Whiting, retreated to Battery Buchanan, the farthest point at the end of the uh, peninsula. They hoped to regroup at Battery Buchanan and hold back the attack until reinforcements could move from Sugarloaf to relieve them, a false hope. Instead, they were met by a subordinate of General Bragg who had arrived from boat by a boat at the battery to take command of the fort. Seeing wounded Lamb and Whiting, the subordinate fled as fast as he had, re he had come, leaving Lamb and Whiting to their fate as Union skirmishers approached in the darkness. Southern officers approached the Union soldiers and indicated their surrender. General Terry was summoned and he accepted the final formal surrender from Lamb and Whiting at midnight as they lay on their hospital stretchers. Signals were flashed to the fleet and Porter ordered rockets fired into the night in celebration. The next morning, scavenging and looting troops apparently wandered into the main magazine of the fort with torches and an explosion killed another 200 soldiers and captives. In addition to these post-battle casualties, Union losses were about 1,400 Army men killed or wounded and 300 sailors and Marines. Confederate losses were 500 men and the rest captured. Whiting died in prison too much two months later. Lamb survived with a terrible hip wound that left him on crutches for years. Secretary of War Stanton toured the fort on January 16th as he was sailing by to Washington after having conferred with General Sherman in South Carolina. Stanton was, of course, delighted with the victory and he praised on both Porter and Terry. As for Bragg, his shock at the loss of Fort Fisher did not delay his plans to evacuate Wilmington. By the middle of February, the following month, he was gone and the city had fallen as Union troops moved up on both sides of the river. A large measure of the defeat must lie here with Bragg, who failed to attack when he had the opportunity and made no opportunity to create a diversion from the North once the attack had begun. Additionally, the fort was strongest on the sea face to withstain a naval with bombardment, while the land fake was weaker because it was assumed that supporting troops would come from Wilmington to defeat any land attack. When Bragg proved unable or unwilling to do this, the weakness of the land face was exploited. Within two weeks, negotiations to discuss a peace settlement began with, Southern, with the Southern government but Lincoln was no longer willing to discuss anything but unconditional surrender. The fall of Fort Fisher had convinced him that unconditional surrender was now only a matter of time. Time heals all wounds. Colonel Lamb on the left here is shown with one of Terry's brigade commanders, Colonel Newton Curtis, sometime long after the war. They faced each other at the battle, but they were friends afterward. And Fort Fisher today, it exists as a state park. Showing the erosion, however, uh, that the ocean has caused to the fort. I'll go off the picture here. Most of the fee states has disappeared. It's the shoreline. This, this is the present shoreline now. All of this has disappeared. Most and all of this has disappeared. There are remnants of the land face and there are remnants of the uh, emplacements of the south. Still an impressive, an impressive uh, view. This is what the shoreline was in 1865. So you can see how far back the erosion has come, has caused and took away the most of the uh, fort existing. 
And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Now, if you have if you have questions, you have to cut. You have to get a speaker so that the uh, audience can hear the question as well as my answer. How long did it take to build the thing? How, how long did it take to build the fort? Well, it, it, it had been a fort for a number of years, but in this configuration, it took two years of Colonel Lamb and General Whiting's uh, efforts to construct all of the traverses and uh, to make it in, in the shape that it was at the time of the battle. Two years, a thousand soldiers and, and slaves to heap up the sand. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. All right. So my first question is, considering Bragg's many previous failings, particularly when commanding the Army of Tennessee, why did Lee grant him command over Whiting? Why did Grant give why did Lee, Lee Grant, give the command of the Wilmington district to Bragg rather than uh, rather than leave it with Whiting? Yes. Well, it wasn't uh, it wasn't uh, Lee who made that decision. It was President Jefferson Davis who had who had Braxton Bragg as an advisor and a close friend. And apparently that friendship impelled him to uh, give the uh, the job to Braxton Bragg rather than leave it with Whiting. Okay, my second question is you mentioned that Porter had previously had several other commands including the capture of New Orleans and Louisiana, but I believe Porter's efforts there were largely ineffective, so why was he thought of so highly despite his previous failings? Well, he was a subordinate of Admiral Farragut at the capture of New Orleans. And although his, his particular role in that attack on New Orleans wasn't particularly effective, he redeemed himself in the following two years at Vicksburg. He was in command on the Mississippi when it captured Vicksburg in conjunction with Grant, who was attacking from the land side and Porter was attacking from the Mississippi Riverside at Vicksburg. Very effective. Okay. Um, you also mentioned previously Will Cushing did a reconnaissance mission to yes. determine if heavy ships would go through the channel and bombard Fort Fisher from right. behind. Right. You why didn't or was there any discussions on potentially sending raiding parties from behind using smaller ships? and attempting to attack Fort Fisher from the rear using small raiding parties, like you mentioned Cushing doing. The, the emplacements such as the Buchanan Mound and Buchanan Battery and the other placements at the mouth of the river were too close to allow any ships to approach that weren't friendly, small or large. Fair enough. Um, also, how many troops approximately did Bragg have up at Sugarloaf around the time of the invasions? He had he had about nine or ten thousand men, but he kept them all behind Sugarloaf and up in Wilmington rather than commit them to try to save the fort. So he had approximately as many men as Terry. He had an equal amount of men as Terry, but he he didn't he re declined to use them. Okay, and my final question is. Why did Terry decide to initially attack Fort Fisher rather than engage Bragg first and said he left his rear potentially open to attack to take the fort first? Wouldn't it have made more sense to defeat Bragg first and then retake or rather take in the first place Fort Fisher rather than leave his rear exposed to attack? Well, I think I think the idea there was 
the attack on Wilmington would have taken a lot longer than the than uh, Gideon Wells was uh, anticipating, and it wouldn't have involved the Navy at all because Wilmington was impervious to uh, to naval attack or to bombardment. They really needed to. The front door to Wilmington was Fort Fisher. They had to get through that front door before they could successfully attack Wilmington. Thank you. How many cannons were there in uh, Fort Fisher? They had, they started with about 47, 48 cannons of various sizes against more than 600 uh, on the combined fleet of Porter. You said that Butler, following the first failure, went home in disgrace or ended his career and he was finished, was never again given any responsibilities. Right. What about Bragg, following Bragg's failure, what happened to him? Sir, I can't tell you. I don't know. Oh, I don't know what happened to Bragg. That's a good question. I should find that out. The war was probably over by then. Yeah. Uh, my question relates to the, the, the beginning of your presentation where the, the blockade runners are running out to Nassau or the other islands. Bermuda. Yeah, and Bermuda. And they're bringing back, as you say, coffee and lead and meat and whatever it may be. Right. Blankets, shoes. Yeah, all the things that the Confederates needed. And Wilmington was the last place to ship those right. to and from. So one would think, therefore, that it's, number one, the last place to send and receive goods. So it's a very important place to defend. And number two, it is still receiving and shipping goods that they would, I'm curious as to why Fort Fisher had so little ammo uh, in, the, in the nature of the fact that they were the one place that the Confederates could receive lead so that the Fort Fisher people should have had the most ammo of anybody. I guess the only answer to that is exhaustion. Here we are three months from the end of the war. But, the supply lines are have been destroyed or severely crippled. The railroads aren't operating. The you know the armies have been defeated. Sherman, after he marched to the sea, is now heading north, cutting through North Carolina. It, it's a mess. And there, the ability of the South to command more ammunition and more cannon and more men was slim. This is my last question, but it seems you said, was it St. George in Bermuda? Was that the name of the place where they were yeah. exchanging the goods from England yeah. and the goods from the South? And apparently that was a huge uh, pivot point. I mean, it was a very important island for the South in order to resupply and to export. Right. Why didn't the Union Navy go after that harbor or that island because that was an important place where they could have destroyed that commerce of the south to and from well, why not I go think, after I think the saint george that, it, it's a political question they had already had an awful lot of difficulty with diplomacy with the british and the british uh, government and they didn't want to antagonize the British uh, into uh, perhaps supporting the South, even at these last months of the war, that the South had decided that they had an ally in England that could uh, lend more support, that would have extended the war extensively. So I think the North didn't want to risk that. Done, thank you.